Whether your company is in growth mode, protecting what they have on hand, or adapting to a new normal, responsible expense management is never far from an executive's mind. This is particularly true during an economic downturn when the cash generated from expense reductions can be invested in growing your competitive advantage or as an alternative to more drastic action. My name is Philip Heidson and in this special five-part Art of Procurement series, I'll share with you the strategies and tactics that you can use to responsibly build the expense management program that your organization needs and achieve cost savings that stick. We'll consider how to build an expense management program, pitfalls to avoid, and the 24 different expense reduction tactics that you can use along the way. I'll be bringing my own personal experience from achieving hundreds of millions of dollars of savings as a practitioner and consultant over the last 20 years in a way that always focused on aligning outcomes with stakeholder and with company needs. In this first part, we kick off the series with a five-step process that should be the foundation of your program to translate data into results. The most successful expense management programs are managed on a programmatic basis. So what do I mean by that? Well, two things really. First, when expense management and cost savings are a day-to-day -day kind of seat at the table requirement for a procurement team. So where you just need to continue to keep churning the savings um, and it's really your table stakes within the organization. So under those circumstances, structure is often forgotten uh, as you're doing the day-to-day -day blocking and tackling. But working closely with stakeholders to understand the needs of the business and having a governance structure to ensure projects remain on track and that the value, the savings that you retrieve are, are appropriately reported, those things should never be forgotten. But secondly, I want to talk about when you have a big burning platform. So your organization may have just launched a big program to save $100 million. It could be $50 million. It could be $500 million. Obviously, it depends on the size of your organization. But there's some big burning platform to save a set amount of money over the next 12 months or 24 months or 36 months. Um, and it is across the entire business. So third-party spend just becomes a part of this. It's usually in response to some tough times or a need to reinvest uh, money elsewhere in the business. So this plan has probably already been committed to your sh uh, shareholders um, or your investors. So the question isn't, can we save this money, but where is this money going to come from? And so in that case, a programmatic approach is even more important. So execs need to be constantly updated on progress. They must have confidence in your plan. And you have to be able to show that you're going to deliver and how you're going to deliver and what the roadmap looks like for you to deliver. Um, the delivery on the other side is actually going to require a lot more active communication and change management with your stakeholders to change their spending habits and culture. Because these programs are typically not opportunistic, you know, where... It's a kind of a phrase I'm not a big fan of, but we hear it all the time, you know, low-hanging fruit. This isn't necessarily about picking the low-hanging fruit. This is around changing behaviors. So a program becomes so much more important. And when we think about an expense management process, I'm going to go at the high level, just kind of share what the steps are. Then I'm going to go into the steps in detail. So step one is about your data. Step two is about needs. Step three is building a structure. Step four is your plan, and step five is deliver. So let's go into those five steps. And step one is that data collection and analysis. So that's really the foundation of any program. You know, you need to know and get a good picture of who you're spending, um, where you're spending it, and with whom you're spending. Um, and so you need to collect that third-party spend data so you can get a complete view of your supplier expenses. Many companies already have spend analysis reporting capabilities. Um, and for those, nothing more than some data maintenance and cleansing and just making sure that data is up to date may be required. But if you're starting from scratch, uh, perhaps you just don't have good uh, rigor in terms of collecting spend data, you really need to start thinking about this in three different ways or three steps, if you will. So first of all, um, you need to identify the data sources. So where is the... Uh, the raw data sitting within your organization that speaks to the spend that you have with your third parties, with your suppliers. It could be on the general ledger, data from the general ledger. It can be held in supplier invoices. It can be uh, P card, you know, uh, corporate credit card data. You need to get all that data, bring it together into one place. 
Second step is cleansing the data. So removing any line items that are obviously not third party spend, you know, such as taxes, for example, or that you know that they're unaddressable. Often intra-company spend gets in here. Um, sometimes spend related to healthcare. Um, there's often pass through expenses. So, you know, taking all that out of your, um, um, your data analysis. And then you go through a process of really normalizing the line items where you have multiple supplier names that represent a single supplier. You know, an example that is often cited is IBM. So you can have IBM, the three initials, you can have IBM, the initials, but with uh, full stops or periods in between the each initial. You can have operating units, for example, IBM UK Limited, uh, IBM LLC for one in the US, IBM GmbH um, in Germany, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can have IBM spelled out the old fashioned way, international business machines. So all of those we need to normalize into a single kind of supplier name so that when you start ruling up all the data, it all shows as being through that single supplier as opposed to you know, showing 10, 20 different suppliers. And then third, we have all that kind of normalizing of the uh, supplier names. It's about categorizing the spend. So categorizing the spend into buckets so you know, well, this is professional services spend. This is facilities spend. Um, this is uh, financial services spend. This is IT spend. You, know, you name it. So you have a better understanding of um, what spend, you know, how that spend is categorized. So you can use a standard taxonomy such as UNS uh, PSC, or you can build your own. Honestly, I recommend uh, if you don't really have something like this in place right now, I recommend that you build your own and also um, don't spend too much time on it. You know, if you're doing this as part of an expense management program, it's more important to be directionally accurate with your categorization, at least right now than it is uh, to be perfect. And you can refine that taxonomy later, but it's really easy to get stuck kind of into this um, this exercise to really overcomplicate your taxonomy. So you are going, you know, two, three, four tiers of data. Um, and yes, that will help you further down the line in terms of having much uh, more detailed categorization, if you will. But right now we're at a step where we need to quickly figure out what the opportunities are. So I would leave that to wait till later. So you go through those three steps. Um, now, as I said at the beginning, you may already have access to this information through your spend analytics tool of choice. If you don't have access to good spend analytics, you know, how are we going to actually go through this process? Well, you can actually build a good enough, what I call a good enough spend cube, and you can do that in Excel or Google Sheets or whatever is your spreadsheet of choice based on all the data sources to at least get an idea of what your spend looks like. And if you're a small or a mid-sized company, honestly, that might be enough. You may not need the kind of the computing power of specific software to go and do that for you, at least not a, you know, a one-time look. Um, over time, you're going to want to continue to refresh. That's where some of this tech comes in. But, you know, if you're doing this as part of a kicking off an expense management program, that might be adequate enough. Now, you can bring on board spend analytics technology to help if you don't have it. Um, and that will help you get a handle on constant updates, make sure that that data is being refreshed on a regular basis. And you can build all the logic that helps you do that. Um, the categorization, the cleansing, the refreshes. Once you're building rules into that technology, most of it, you know, is done for you. So you'll get every month or how, whatever the, uh, how often you want to do your refreshes. You'll still have some spend that needs to be normalized, cleansed, classified, but a very small amount relative um, to the number of line items that you have coming into the tool. Um, a lot of folks look at building this something like this in-house, and honestly, I understand why that is and has been the case. What I would say is that um, you know prices of spend analytics technology do vary wildly, and it's not necessarily based on feature and functionality, but by the amount of heavy lifting that you do versus you know what your selected provider will do during the onboarding phase. So. Uh, you know, in these days, it's not unheard of to find a solution where you do most of the work, but you're leveraging a really robustly built tool for $10,000 a year 
or you can be spending a hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars on something that um, you know where a lot of the work is done for you. So really, just have a think about that when you look at is technology something that's in reach for me. Um, and third, you can obviously hire an outside consultant to do uh, either of those two for you. You know, building the spend cube in Excel. Um, just based on their experience, they'll be able to do that a lot faster. They'll know where to look for the data. Um, or second, to help you bring on board a spend analytics tool. Um, so, you know, both of those are obviously options for you. Either way, this really has to be the foundation of your expense management program. And the results are going to give you a place to start. Um, but, you know, you're also still going to have to roll up your sleeves and review line level invoice details for suppliers or categories of spend, uh, you know, the products and services that you buy when you want to go and do a deeper dive. All right, step two of the expense management process is needs assessment. So one of the pitfalls, we're going to talk um, in part two a, a little bit more about pitfalls, um, is undertaking strategies and tactics that aren't aligned with the needs of the business. So when I think about a needs assessment, you know, it comes in two forms. One, what's the overarching goals of the company? So this may be the expense reduction target that's been communicated to investors, as we said before, you know, a burning platform that the entire organization has. Um, and so how are we aligning this expense management program with that? But the second is what are the needs of individual business or functional leaders and budget holders? So a good place to start there is actually, um, especially when you're doing this as part of a broader initiative, is to do a bottoms up review of external spend, you know, across each stakeholder um, group or category. Um, because you can look at every element of spend and say, you know, that's mission critical, that's nice to have, or that's kind of a luxury spend. So think about this as zero-based budgeting for each category of spend. And doing that, you know, really helps to, to start to see where um, opportunities to, you know, just not spend at all, we're going to talk about demand management later in the series, um, can come up. But it's just truly important. You know, I've seen so many times when um, cost savings initiatives and expense management programs are run in a way that really isn't aligned and connected with what the business actually needs. You know, you end up cutting things that are critical to the business. Um, it just, it, it leads to difficulties. You know, one in the perception of the role that you're playing as procurement, therefore your ability to have an even deeper impact. Um, and two, on the ability of the business to actually do what they need to do to operate. So those things really important so step two understand the true needs of the business and the true needs of your stakeholders step three is um, building a structure so the most effective expense management programs are actually guided by a pretty strong framework um, and so here are a couple of elements that you really want to think about when you're building a structure around your expense management program again whether it's uh, something that is to support a broader initiative or really on the day-to-day, -day, you know, achieving savings on a day-to-day -day basis. So the first one is program management and governance. So assigning an expense management uh, PMO or program management of office. I think that this is probably more relevant when you're looking at a big burning platform than it is the day-to-day. -day. You can have somebody in the procurement organization who is kind of assigned this role on a day-to-day -day basis to at least have oversight to make sure that the savings that are being um uh, plan for are being delivered and this could even be you know just the role of the procurement leader the procurement manager in smaller organizations this may be a partial resource but in larger ones there actually may be uh, you may have the ability the bandwidth the roi to dedicate a specific role a program manager you know and bringing in additional specialists from finance from communications from change management to help drive the program management you know, this person is responsible for overseeing progress against goals, liaising between departments and leading program governance. Second part of structure is a project intake and a triage process. So one of the biggest challenges that a procurement team faces during an enterprise-wide expense reduction program is bandwidth. You know, uh, I think there's many ways to address this and is probably the topic of future podcasts around how as procurement um, teams we can get more with less um, but a good foundational block that's relatively easy to put in place is a project intake process so it's key that all the projects any potential projects are managed through a single process you know starting with 
a project intake or the triage desk. Some organizations call it different things. But basically, it helps you bring all the requests into one place so leadership can quickly understand resource constraints, but also allows um, projects to be assigned to the most appropriate resource. So what you are trying to avoid here is the most impactful team members not actually leading low impact projects because honestly, especially when we're in this mode of building a bit stronger business partnerships, it's really hard to say no to a project, even if it may be one that from an organizational perspective, it makes more sense for somebody else on the team to actually do. So that project intake and triage process really takes the decision out of their hands and also begins the process of understanding the projects and the projects that you have in flight and kind of tracking those um, from inception through to delivery. And then the last element around structure is using a simple kind of stage gate process for the sourcing um, or the negotiation. Um, it doesn't have to be a sourcing project. There's really any expense management tactic that you have um, can have this stage gate process. Now, when I talk about stage gate process, I think that there's a few things that turn off potential stakeholders more than saying, hey, you know, here is our five or seven or nine step process. You know, they look at that and say, you know what, I think I can do this faster th uh, on my own. Thank you very much. Um, so that's a common argument from stakeholders, but it doesn't have to be like that. So when you think of a simple stage gate process and you're using it more strategically, it can actually be a really key driver of stakeholder alignment. So when I think about um, a stage gate process, really, only two stages are needed, one at the beginning of the process and two at the end of the process. So the beginning of the process is where you are approving with your stakeholder, with finance, um, if you have finance you know, in the room with you, um, what the strategy looks like for any particular project. So you're agreeing on the baseline spend, you're agreeing on whatever the savings or the benefits uh, calculation methodology will be, the scope of the opportunity, the suppliers that you're gonna be involved, any tactics and strategies that you're gonna use in this initiative. So getting sign off from procurement, from finance and from stakeholders, um, that's a really good way of making sure everyone's on the same page. And that really should be secured before executing any of the agreed upon strategies or tactics. It's actually useful as well to use because a lot of stakeholders think, well, procurement, you know, I don't, I, I'm still the decision maker. I don't want you procurement to be making decisions. And you spend so much time kind of trying to help stakeholders understand, look, ultimately it's your, you are spending the money. I'm not going to tell you which supplier you can use. I can recommend to you based on all these different inputs which supplier that we should uh, we think we should use, but it's your decision. So doing something like this helps them recognize that, you know, the decision isn't going to be taken out of their hands. They're just going to have to have a really good justification for the decision and the recommendation that they make. So step one sets everything out. Um, you know, when you think about savings methodologies, it can be um, looking at uh, what the baseline methodology is. So comparing price paid in a previous period for the same or materially similar products and service versus what you're going to be paying going forward. You can look at substitution methodology, which is comparing the price paid in the previous pay period with a new price for a different product or service, but that provides the same outcome or something like a market basket methodology, which is again, comparing the old price that you paid versus the new price for just a representative selection of products and services that you get uh, within that category or from that supplier, where it doesn't make sense to track every item individually. You know, maybe that's just due to the fact that there is a lot of volume of different items purchased. Um, briefly going on a tangent, part of this debate um, that happens is whether we should count cost avoidance towards a cost savings target. Um, and honestly, you know, I think that the rationale for cost avoidance is a really strong one. You know, we do create value um, when we negotiate away a cost increase, you know, mitigating a cost increase, or whether we have a really used a lot of market knowledge and data or leverage or whatever the tactics may be to reduce the price of something that would have been bought at a higher level if we hadn't got involved. Absolutely value is created there. However, how do we report on that? You know, my recommendation really is to track and report cost avoidance separately as part of a balanced scorecard 
rather than including that in your expense reduction reporting. So we think about we've got the approval for the strategy for how we're going to measure savings, what the tactics are going to look like. The other stage at the end is what well, the outcomes. So we've agreed on the chosen supplier, the pricing, the implementation time frame, the roles and responsibilities, uh, the final savings and benefit calculation. All that should be signed off by the same team, you know, finance, procurement, stakeholder, and then should be formalized once the final decision is made and contracts are signed. So you have just a very good and clear beginning and end of a project. That's all it takes. Those are pretty simple documents, um, but it, it really brings in some kind of consistency to how you approach the project management and also accountability um, throughout and uh, helps you be clear on roles and responsibility for implementation. All right, so that was step three, was building a structure. So first of all, if we go back, step one was the data collection. Step two was the needs assessment. Step three was building a structure. So step four is then building your wave plan. So a wave plan is a prioritization, basically of the initiatives that you've identified through an analysis of your spend. So factors that you would take into account when building a wave plan will include specific needs of the company, as we talked about before, we understood in that step two, and the urgency behind those needs, needs of the individual stakeholders that we talked about, the complexity and the time to value of each initiative. You know, there may be some that um, just have a longer time frame and we need cost savings now. So do we prioritize the ones where we're going to get some quick cost savings? Or there's a potential for quick cost savings versus those projects that are a little bit more complex. The strategic importance of the product or service. So it may be something where the pricing of that product or service is fundamental to our ability to be flexible and agile in the marketplace. Or it could be that that is um, a really important product or service and we don't want to uh, upset the apple cart right now. So that may impact the timing of when you actually go and um, you know put that into your wave plan. You know, we want to look at the micro market conditions of the product or service. So are there some things that you buy that are just ripe for, um, you know, an opportunity because market conditions have changed? You want to look at the time since you last sourced or reviewed the spend with a particular supplier or in a particular category, because it may be something that you've just kind of accepted the 3% um, um, year on year cost increases over time and not really looked at it. And there may be some money that you can take off the table fairly quickly um, in those circumstances. You want to look at contract expiration dates. Um, so what's coming up in the next 6, 12 months for expiration versus what's not. Um, the bandwidth of your stakeholder team and procurement resources. You know, it's one thing to go through this whole process and identify 20 projects in one particular category area um, that have a quick hit opportunity. But the reality is, you know, your stakeholder isn't going to be able to support that from a bandwidth and you probably aren't as a procurement team either so again select what is most important now and perhaps um, schedule some of those for uh, later in the day you know further on in your wave plan like a wave two or a wave three and then the last uh, really consideration of your wave plan is what executive support do you have for expense management for each area of spend so you may have an area and this is more the case when um, you're doing this as a day-to-day -day versus a part of a burning platform, but it often does still come into play when you're working under a burning platform, is you'll have um, you know closer relationships, more trusted relationships with certain stakeholders than others. Um, you know, Do you want to just um, consider that in your wave plan? So you're working with those that are already advocates to get quick wins, and then you can use those quick wins as a... Um, you need to break down some of the barriers that may exist for those who are a little bit less receptive to working with you. Um, and it maybe makes their position of doing that a little bit more untenable because you're showing such benefits in other areas. So that, that's really what I would consider when I'm putting together uh, my way of plans. So that's what are the needs of the company, needs of the stakeholders, the complexity and time to value of the initiatives, the strategic importance of what you're buying, the market conditions for the products and services, the time since you last sourced or reviewed the spend, contract expiration dates, the bandwidth that you have or your stakeholder group has, and what exec support do you have under each category. Now, the last point to say on that, this wave plan 
it's not a procurement wave plan. It must be signed off by other executive leaders. The exact leaders are going to be dependent upon the governance framework that you have in place, but at minimum, it should be agreed by the functional leaders and budget owners impacted. Even better is when it's approved by executive management, such as a CFO, COO or CEO, um, and in the case of broad expense management programs, you know, the executive program leader, because everyone really needs to be aligned that this is the plan. This is how we're going to approach this. This is what our roadmap looks like. And then step five. Well, step five, it's time to deliver. We're not really going to talk about that much in this podcast because we're going to talk about that a lot more in part two of the special series. But step five is really... Um, You've got your wave plan. Now we need to go and execute your expense management tactics at the category level. So tune in tomorrow for part two of the special series. That's all for today. Um, our special series is expense management, achieving cost savings that stick. And we're going to start talking actually tomorrow about some of the pitfalls um, to avoid before um, parts three through five later in the week, which are going to be looking at specific tactics. So thanks for joining me today. And I'll be back with you tomorrow. Thanks for listening to this Art of Procurement special series. For more information and for templates and cheat sheets that you can use to help drive savings that stick, we've created a free-to-access expense management hub that is powered by AOP Mastermind. For more information about the expense management hub, go to artofprocurement.com slash expense hub. That's artofprocurement.com slash expense hub.